Hi, everyone. I hate, to, I hate to interrupt all the fun conversations. If I can have everybody's attention. I feel like we could spend another hour just enjoying tea and sitting and chatting, but we do have a guest backstage who's very eager to come out and talk to you all. So hi, my name is Sarah Blumenfeld. I'm the Development and Program Director for the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation. In planning today, I was frequently reminded how fortunate we are here to have such wonderful volunteers at the library. So much of what makes this place special is because of volunteers. And I'm grateful to everyone who's given their time and talent to the library, from our, some of our founders who are here in the room who helped open this library 14 years ago. We have past board members here, current board members like Rita who was greeting everyone at the door. Everyone contributes to this library and I'm really grateful for the for the support, it really makes this place special. I want to call out Susan Buckland and S Sandy Higgins and Janice Katolica, our great team, and uh, Jan Berkefelt for setting up the tea. It takes a village, ladies. There's no way one person could have put up, to, you know, put everything out today. And I also want to say thank you to Pat from Arinda Books. We have a great collaboration with Arinda Books, and they generously donate a percentage of the book sales today back to the library. If you have a book and you'd like it personalized, I'll ask you when we leave to go out the back door and we'll be lining up in front of the table out there. She'll be available to chat, take a picture, sign books. Um, if you aren't interested or already feel good just about what you've got, just go out the front door here. So now's a good time to remind everyone to silence your cell phones. Today's program is gonna be our last one before our summer break. The Distinguished Speaker Series will return in September when we welcome San Francisco artist and author Paul Madonna, followed in October by the 2023 winner of the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction. My gratitude today is also starts with Lisa C. She responded to an email and said to her people, when can you get me into the Lafayette Library? So I'm grateful to her for, for making this happen. She has a very tight schedule. She told me she's doing two events a day through the next couple weeks. So we're really lucky that she's here with us today. We know her as the New York Times bestselling author many times over for Secret uh, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, Island of the Sea Woman. Uh, she has a mystery series and a memoir on Gold Mountain, which tells the story of her Chinese American family settlement in Los Angeles. She's the recipient of the Golden Spike Award for the Chinese Historical Association of Southern California. And she's also was named Woman of the Year by the Organization of Chinese American Women. Today, she's here to talk about her latest historical novel, Lady Tan's Circle of Women. The book was inspired by the true story of a woman physician from the 15th century and her journals known as Records of a Female Doctor. There's a lot to talk about with Lisa about her book and about her inspiration for this, so please join me in welcoming Lisa C. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. I just want to say I've been out on the road since June 6th, uh, going to a city or a state a day. It's been quite <laughs> quite, a, quite an experience, and I still won't get home until July 9th. And here's the thing, you know, writers really spend most of their time alone in a room, and I, for one, don't actually ever imagine that anyone is going to read my books. I mean, I just, I don't really think about that. I just think I'm just writing my story, and I don't know what happens to it after that. So it's just amazing to come out and see people and realize, oh my God, there are people who read them. <laughs> so thank you. I'm very grateful. And I'm really grateful that um, I'm able to participate in something that is raising money for libraries. Libraries have meant so much to me in my life. Um, not just as when I was a little girl, but they are still completely important to me as a writer, um, you know, where I do so much of my research, whether it's a library like this, a, you know, a community library, or if it's more like a research library. And I would not be able to write the kinds of books that I do without libraries and incredible librarians. But 
that's not why we're here for me to thank everybody over and over. Uh, I'm here really to talk about Lady Tan's circle of women and how this idea came about. You know, the thing is, I, you know, is it fate? Is it fortune? Is it destiny? How do these books sort of fall into my hands? I typically think about a book for 5, 15, 20 years before I decide this is the one with Island of Sea Women. I thought about that for eight years. With Tigrel of Hummingbird Lane, it was 20 years before I found my way into that story. I mean, I'd been thinking about it, but I just didn't have my way in. This book was completely different, and actually we have to scroll back in time now about five years to when um, Island of Sea Women came out. And I went out on book tour for that, and I thought I knew what the next book was going to be. I'd been quietly collecting material, you know, gathering stuff for this next book. And I was getting close to beginning to write, and a year had gone by, and now it was March 2020, and I needed to go out on the book tour for the paperback of Island of Sea Women. I left home on March 10th, 2020. I went to five states in five days, and then the country and the world shut down, and I was sent home. And so there I was at home, and as you all remember, there was this uh, interesting thing where there were essential workers, and then everybody else, all the rest of us. And it turns out, you know, writers are not very essential. <laughs> I couldn't work on that idea that I'd been thinking about for so long because I couldn't go to China to do research. This particular book was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into a very remote part of China. No way to do that in 2020. 20, I still wouldn't go to some place that re remote, whether it was in China or some other part of the world today. So that was just, and plus, you know, every library, every research library, every archive, everything was closed. So that idea was just gone. And so there I was, home alone with my husband, 24 hours a day. <laughs> And I, I really hate to sound melodramatic, but I just had this feeling of, well, my life is over. <laughs> I mean, I can't go to China. I can't do the research I like to do. I mean, there was nothing I could do. And so I was moping around the house, and every once in a while I'd call one of our sons, and I'd say, you know, wouldn't you like to come over and see your mom? <laughs> no, mom, I don't want to be the person who kills you. <laughs> You may remember that yourselves, and I was, and so you know, it, things are pretty grim. And I bought my first ever pair of pajamas. I bought my second ever pair of pajamas. You can, you know, this was not going well. And then it was all the way in October, so many months had gone by. And I was walking through my office. I have a whole wall of research books. I walk back and forth by that probably 10 times a day. But for some reason on that day, the spine of one of those books jumped out at me. I, and I really don't know why. It was a pale gray jacket with slightly darker gray lettering. But for whatever reason, it jumped out. I pulled it down, reproducing women, pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I opened it up. I had had that book on my shelf for 10 years and had never opened it. But I thought, well, you know, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. My life is over. So this is the time to start reading. And I did sit down right that minute and begin to read. I got to page 19, and there was a mention of a woman doctor, Tan Yan Shen, who in the Ming Dynasty uh, published a book of her cases when she turned 50 in 1511. And I thought, this is just like it was amazing on all kinds of levels. A woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty, of somebody who publishes a book when she turns 50, that it was more than 500 years ago. It was just all of it amazing to me. I set that book down, went to the internet to see what else I could find out about her, and uh, it turned out that her book was available not only in Chinese, but also in English. And so although I am a huge, huge, huge 
supporter of independent bookstores. I, um, <laughs> ordered that book from and, <laughs> and I had it within 24 hours. And so instead, <laughs> instead of thinking about this idea for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it was all of 26 hours. Now, um, I kept going back to this fact that this book had been published in 1511. How many books can you think of that were published before 1500 that are still in print today? You've got the Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies, Beowulf. We could expand beyond the Western canon, the Mahabharata, the I Ching in China, the Book of Odes, the Book of History also from China. You know, there are a few around the world all of them written by men. There are a couple of exceptions. The Tale of Genji, written by a woman in Japan. There was a Catholic nun, Hildegard von Bingen, who in the 1100s wrote two books that uh, were for women that had um, herbal remedies in them. What to do if you, you know, what to make if you have cramps, what to make if you can take if you want to get pregnant what to make and take if you want to end an unwanted pregnancy, a Catholic nun who had written this. Um, so, you know, the, the few things, few and far between, but they did exist that had been written by women. But really, you have to go many centuries before you start to see books that are written by women. It's a long time before you get to the Bronte sisters, Jane Austen, George Sand, Emily Dickinson, and still, they're still few and far between. And it's really not until about 100 years ago, the 1920s, that Virginia Woolf starts writing novels, and she really changes everything for women writers. So again, I was just fascinated by all of this. Plus, of the 12,000 known historic medical texts in China, only three were written by women, and this is the oldest. So very little is known about Tan Yanshan's life. There is her book. They are, there are a few uh, forewords and uh, some afterwards written by mostly her male relatives. And then she also wrote an introduction where she writes about her life and how she became a doctor and her sort of approach to medicine and women's health. So uh, when she was a little girl at age eight, she went to live with her grandparents. And at night, her grandfather liked to drink wine and have her recite poetry to him. And one night, apparently, he said, and this is a direct quote, supposedly from him, this girl is very intelligent. We should not restrict her to ordinary needlework, but instead we can let her study my medicine. Now, he had retired from an official post, and then in his retirement, he had decided to become what was known as a literati doctor, a doctor who learns how to be a doctor by reading books. Uh, but his wife, Tan Yanshan's grandmother, was what was known as a hereditary doctor. She had learned from her parents, who'd learned from their parents, and learned from their parents, and so on. And so it's really from her grandmother that she learned medicine. Now, I'm not giving too much away to say that Tan Yanshan was quite sickly as a girl and even into adulthood. And there are several times when, she, and again, I'm not giving anything away, where she came close to death. And at one of these moments, uh, there, there came um, a night when her husband and mother-in-law sat by her bedside and planned her funeral. So she was well enough to hear that, which must not have been a very good evening, you know, if you think about it. <laughs> and on that same night, her grandmother, who had been dead for many years, came to visit her as a ghost or an apparition. And the grandmother was very upset with her. It's like, you know, this, enough with this being sick business. Um, you are a bad example to your family, and I want you to go to one of my old notebooks where I have remedies and go to page 
78. And on that page, you're going to find a remedy. If you make it and take it, you're going to get better. You're, you, you won't die. But not only that, you're, you're going to be done with being sick for the rest of your life. And as long as I'm here, I have good news. Um, I'm here to tell you that you're going to live to be 73. Now, her grandmother was correct about all of that stuff up until the age that Yun Chun uh, was her predicted death because, in fact, she lived to be 96. 96 today, pretty remarkable, really remarkable for a woman or anyone in the 1500s. What else captivated me about her? First, she completely circumvented the rules that existed about women and what women could and could not do. This is really the height of Confucianism in China. It, in, it was, had an influence on society, culture, families. And if you've read any of my books, you know, he was a great thinker, don't get me wrong, but he, he didn't have a lot of love and respect for women. I think that's really fair to say. And so there, he has all kinds of sayings, things like, um, when a girl, obey your father. When a wife, obey your husband. When a widow, obey your son. An educated woman is a worthless woman. A good woman will never take more than three steps beyond her front gate. So Tan Yanshan was a traditional, proper wife and woman. She went into an arranged marriage when she was 15. She had four children. She managed her husband's household. And yet somehow she managed to do all of that, look good on the surface, um, but still become a doctor and practice medicine and have today what we would call a career. The second is really had to do with the traditions surrounding traditional Chinese medicine. Now, in back in those days, but all the way up until very, very recently, there was a saying in the medical profession that said, a woman is 10 times more difficult to treat than a man. Now, of course, they would have that saying because 99.9999999% of all doctors were men. Men, male doctors, could not be in the same room or see their patients, their female patients, whether it was a girl or a woman. And so what would happen is the doctor would sit behind a curtain or behind a screen, or better yet, out in the hallway, and then a girl's father or a woman's husband would go back and forth between the doctor getting his questions, going over to the patient, getting the answers, and relaying them back and forth. Now, I love my husband and sons very, very much, but I would not want them to be the go-between between me and any of my doctors, but particularly, we'll just say my gynecologist. You know, I, I could pass on that. But she could be right in the room with her patients. She could look at a woman and see, was she pale? Was she flushed? Was she swollen? Did she have a rash? She could smell her. She could feel her pulse, pul pulses. In Chinese medicine, there are 26 basic pulses, quite different from how we look at pu the pulse, um, or Western medicine looks at the pulse. A male doctor, the only time he could feel a woman's pulse was if she truly was at death's door. And they would take these long strips of cloth, often binding cloth used for the feet, wrap it around her wrist. They'd stick her arm out through the curtain, and he would try to feel through these layers of cloth down to her pulse. But most important, Tan Yan Shen could be in the room with her patients to talk to them to talk woman to woman or woman to girl. She had been through every phase of a woman's life. She had been a little girl. She'd gone through adolescence. <coughs> She'd gotten married. She'd had children. Later, she had the wonderful gift of menopause. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that wonderful gift of menopause. <laughs> so 
she could talk about these physical you know, things related to women's bodies that she herself had experienced. But of course, we are women, and so our emotions are very much tied to what's happening in our bodies, and she too had felt joy and grief and sorrow and anger and fury and all of those emotions that everyone feels but that women can often feel and have to kind of hide. So she could do that. Now, most of her cases are believed to be the women and girls who lived in her husband's, fam her husband's family compound. Back in those, and this was a very elite family, a very wealthy family. And they lived in one of these very large Chinese compounds where you would live typically with between 40 and 100 of your husband's relatives. My idea of hell, right? <laughs> and plus, plus the servants who took care of them. So most of her cases, scholars believe, are the women and girls who lived in this compound plus the servants, the scullery maid, the ladies maid, all these servants who took care of these wealthy elite women and girls. But then how do you explain the woman who holds a tiller on a ship, a woman who is a brick and tile maker? If Tan Yun Shan wasn't allowed to go beyond more than three steps beyond her front gate, how did she come in contact with those women? This was one of those questions that from the very, very beginning completely obsessed me, which of course made me turn to research. Now again, China was closed, all the research libraries were closed. I live very close to UCLA. I've been in all seven research libraries. All of the research libraries remain closed throughout the entire writing of this book. And so I had to do this in a different way. I will say though, by now, you know, after all these years and all these books, I do feel like I have a certain body of knowledge. Tanya and Shen lived in a what's called in Wuxi, which is a water town in the Yangtze Delta. If you can visualize the Yangtze Delta kind of like the Mississippi Delta, you have all of these tributaries, and there are towns built along these tributaries. In China, along the Yangtze, there are these water towns where the houses are built right up against the water. And it, you can look at one of those towns kind of like a miniature Venice, except there are many, many, many of them. And so people are going back and forth on the canals, and it's, you know, it's again, it's like Venice. Now, I had not been to Wuxi, I couldn't go to Wuxi, but I have been to many of the other water towns. I've stayed in many of the water towns, uh, particularly when I was doing research for Peony and Love. I tried to think about the house, this big compound where she would live. Now, her own home no longer exists, or her husband's home no longer, or the family home no longer exists. But I have been in many traditional Chinese compounds. For example, back when I was working on one of the mysteries, I was coming back from the interior of China, uh, back to the capital, and the driver said, hey, you know, I want to, you know, would you like to see this house? And it was the home of a former salt merchant, and huge. You know, he had like 50 bedrooms and different pavilions and terraces and just this huge, huge place surrounded by a wall. And as I was walking through, I was, you know, this looks kind of vaguely familiar to me. And that's because it was used in the filming of Raise the Red Lantern, in case any of you have ever seen it. So in many ways, that house is kind of a model for the house where Tanya and Shen lives. The other is the garden the, of, uh, that is next to the house. And not every wealthy family had a private garden, but the town of Suzhou is known for these incredible gardens, particularly the humble administrator's garden, a place that I've been many, many times. And then in Los Angeles at the Huntington, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, uh, to the Chinese garden. And that's a place I've been really a lot. So the Garden of Fragrant Delights is really 
modeled on both the Chinese garden at the Huntington, but also the one that's um, at, in Suzhou. But of course, that only got me so far. And after that, this is where fate, fortune, destiny came back into play. The first person that I wanted to find was the woman who had done the translation of miscellaneous records of a female doctor. And I went to the internet, and I'm looking all over, and I'm trying to find her, and I'm looking and looking and looking. It turned out she lived in Santa Monica, 10 minutes from my house. And so although this was still the, you know, before we had vaccines and we couldn't meet in person, we would meet on Zoom all the time. She helped me so much. She'd say, oh, you have to talk to this professor. You have to go talk to this researcher. Or um, she'd send me a note and say, uh, someone's giving a lecture on the tradition of ghost pregnancies in the Ming Dynasty. It's a lecture that's happening in Singapore, our time, two in the morning, but you should watch it, <laughs> and, I, and I would. Another person who helped me was a professor at UC Irvine, and his area of expertise is actually Shanghai. I didn't need that, but over the years, he's someone I have gone to many times when I need something, but I can't find it. So there are things that pop up when you're writing that you just, it's like you didn't anticipate it. You know, I, I feel like when I start a book, I've done all the research, I'm ready to roll. But things happen. So there came a point in the novel where I really needed someone to send a letter. Did they have a mail system in the Ming Dynasty? So uh, I sent a note to Jeff. He put me in contact with a professor who has spent the last 40 years studying the male system of the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> Another question I had, and it, again, this took a long time before I got there, was that Yun Shen was going to travel from Wuxi up to the capital on the Grand Canal in 1496. This is not like looking up the Amtrak schedule or the schedule for United. I mean, it's very, very hard to find. And I'm looking and I'm asking people and I'm getting passed from person to person to person. And finally, someone says, you know, there was this graduate student a few years ago who for his project uh, translated a diary that was written by a man who was a Korean man who was made the ambassador to Jeju Island, Jeju, where the, my previous book, Island of Sea Women, took place. He was on his way to Jeju and was shipwrecked off the coast of China, taken prisoner in 1494, two years before I needed, and was sent on the Grand Canal to the capital. And for this whole time period, he kept a diary and this is what was translated. So in the diary, what he saw every day, how far they traveled every day, what he ate, what the weather was like. This was just like this unbelievable gift that just kind of came down and dropped into my lap, although I did have to look pretty hard to find it. There was a professor at, at uh, Harvard who I was so scared to reach out to. He's like the chair of the department, and I, I just was like, there is no way this guy is going to talk to me. We ended up having so many conversations on Zoom. And it, it's funny, it only hit me the other day when I was out on the road that all of these people who helped me, they must have been as lonely <laughs> as I was. And you know, you can imagine like the, the, I mean, I don't know if he has a wife, but the wife of the man who spent all that time on Ming Dynasty, um, mail system, you know, maybe his wife was kind of tired of hearing about it, but I was like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> okay, but I also just kept going back to Tan Yan Shun's cases, the daughter of a concubine who suffers from food damage caused by excessive love, a woman whose ailments stem from too much weeping, a young woman who's just given birth who's suffering from something called postpartum wind itching, something you do not want to have. I also drew on contemporaneous stories 
of other women, um, particularly uh, in connection to childbirth and pregnancy and, and postpartum period. And it's interesting because although this was a very long time ago, there were a lot of records kept about women's health. And so uh, I don't think I'm giving too much away to say that when you come to the following three stories that involve a worm, a message being written on a baby's foot, and something that happens in front of the empress, all of those happened to real women. I didn't make them up. These happened to real women. OK, so uh, I am a woman. Most, almost everyone here, except for two men, I think, are uh, women. Um, I write about women. I write about mothers and daughters, sisters. But the main relationship I keep coming back to is friendship. And the reason is, this is a unique relationship that we have in our lives. We will tell a friend something that we wouldn't tell a boyfriend, a lover, our husband, our mother, our children. It's a very, very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, any time you have your heart open like that, you are open to being hurt. And so I love to write about the strong bonds of friendship, but I'm also very curious about those little dark, shadowy corners um, of female friendship. And wherever I see those corners, that's often where I want to go. And so very early on, uh, Tanya Shun meets the daughter of a um, midwife. This girl is training to be a midwife. These two girls should never know each other. They are of different classes. The, the ideas of medicine and what um, a doctor or a midwife can do are completely different. Doctors were not allowed to touch or come in contact with blood in any way. But a midwife, of course, has her hands in blood all the time. And back to Confucius, Confucius had laid out this kind of um, hierarchy of professions in China. At the very, very bottom were coroners, butchers, and um, midwives people who came in contact with blood. And so although these two girls should not even talk to each other, there is a series of circumstances that brings them together. And of course, they become friends, but it's going to be a bumpy ride. So I, I'm not going to read from the book, but I do want to read to you a couple of um, aphorisms from that time that talk about friendship. But I think they are as applicable today as they were 500 years ago. Friendship is a contract between two hearts. With two hearts united, women can laugh and cry, live and die together. A friend without faults will never be found. It takes a lifetime to make a friend, but you can lose one in an hour, that's for sure. Life without a friend is life without sun. Life without a friend is death. I was surprised when I started writing this how relevant the story would become. Obviously, we were in the middle of a pandemic. But as I was doing the research, I learned that smallpox swept through China every three years. China invented something called variolation. What would happen is the so-called smallpox planting master would come in and he would gather up the scabs of someone who had had smallpox, maybe they lived, maybe they died, grind them up, and then blow them through a long tube into someone's nose. Or, this is even more gruesome, um, they would you know, go to someone who had smallpox, and these are horrible. I mean, if you really want to gross yourself out, look on Wikipedia at photographs of people who have smallpox. It's really like a thousand times worse than you could imagine. And so you have these kind of superating wounds. And they would take that goog stuff coming out and wipe it right here on a baby's nose. Obviously, there were some problems with this. You could get sick. 
you could be scarred, you could die, but if you survived the process, as the majority of people did, you were inoculated for life against smallpox. Now, what really amazed me is in those days, there was a lot of controversy about this. Should we do it? Should we not? Here are the reasons to do it. Here are the reasons not. It's not just that they were arguing those points. The language that they used were the exact same words, the exact same arguments that we have been hearing in this country for the last three years. I mean, exact. So that was one, and then the other really had to do with uh, women's health. And just as I was finishing the first draft, the Dobbs decision came down. That was, you know, we just had the one year anniversary a few days ago. Um, and obviously, this question of who has control over women's bodies has been with us, I've been looking around the room, at least in our lifetimes. But you can go back in time to Tanya and Shun's day in the 1500s, back to that Catholic nun in the 1100s. Again, who has control over a woman's body? All the way back, I'm sure, to caveman days. And if we think about it, jumping forward to when we're all living on Mars, I think people are still going to be arguing about who has control over a woman's body. I'm just going to take a quick look at the time. OK, so uh, before I end, I just want to say a couple of things. I love to talk to book clubs on Zoom. This, uh, if you ever want me to join, you just send me an email. If I can do it, I will. I can't always do it. On my website, I have a reader's guide uh, with discussion questions, but also activities you can do in your book club. Um, on the website, there's also, for every book, something called Step Inside the World of Tea Girl, Island of you know, Sea Women, in this case, Lady Tan, that has photographs, videos, articles, links to all kinds of things, foot binding, traditional Chinese houses, makeup in the Ming Dynasty, all kinds of stuff. I, and then last, um, for, the, I, for Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, the Bana Tea Company created a special tea package for book clubs. She's now created one for this book using the teas that Tanyan Shun and her friend Mei Ling drink in the book. And the reason those particular teas are in the book is because they're two of my favorites. <laughs> and so she created this very sweet little package um, that's good for a book club, but she also has it for individual people who just want to read a book and sip the teas that the characters are reading, uh, drinking, and you can find links to all that stuff on my website. All right, so after Tanya and Chen died at age 96, there came a point when her book kind of disappeared from the marketplace. And she had a great, great nephew who decided that he wanted to save this book from obscurity. He found a copy, he transcribed it with brush and ink, he paid to have the wood blocks carved to have it published. And in his final afterword that's in the book, he wrote, may she leave a noble name that will not decline in the future. And I hope in my small way, I have added to helping to save her noble name. But even more important than that, by reading her story, all of you are helping to preserve her noble name. Thank you so much. We, we have a couple minutes for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question behind of Lisa, you. please raise your hand and I'll right come around you. with a microphone. Oh. Thank you so much, very fascinating. I'm curious, what's the story about the cover of this book and what she's wearing? So the story with the cover of this book is obviously they don't, there's no photograph or painting that exists of her. And this is, they actually took photographs from three women and photoshopped them together to create an imaginary woman. Um, I have had so many people say she's kind of like the Mona Lisa, like no matter where you are, she's following you. And uh, this was the one thing that did happen was they sent me 
uh, the same woman but with diff the, a different background color. So I probably had 10 different versions and I put them all around the house and just would walk by, but this was the one that was so beautiful and, and I just absolutely love it. It's perfect. Any other questions? Thank you. How did that book get in your bookshelf? I'm sorry, say that. How did the book get in your bookshelf, the one that you found? Where did you find it? You know, I don't know. I know it's a University of California Press book, and I actually saw someone from UC Press this morning, and she asked me the same question, like, oh, did, you, did we give it to you? And I was like, I, don't, I just don't remember what I, I think. I may have just bought it somewhere along the line. I mean, I have a lot of research books. That doesn't mean I've opened them all you know, or read them all. But that may have been something that I thought, oh, this will come in handy one day. I just, but I don't even, I don't even remember how it got there. Did I see a hand over here? Okay. All of your books are, or uh, most of them, many of them, uh, Chinese background. So what is your relationship to? Oh, thank you. I should have said that somewhere in here. So I grew up in a very large Chinese American family. My great great grandfather came here to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. He was an herbalist by coincidence. Uh, my great grandfather came and stayed and uh, he started out really in Sacramento where he did a lot of, he came here as a 14 year old boy where he did a lot of the jobs that immigrants do even today. He worked in the fields, he washed dishes in restaurants, he swept up in factories. But by the time he was 30 in the 1880s, he had his first business. It was a factory that made crotchless underwear for brothels. <laughs> And um, one day into his shop came a young woman who I think of as being quintessentially American. Her family had come out west on the Oregon Trail, had settled, you know, um, homesteaded in Oregon. Her mother died when she was a baby. Her father died when she was seven, seven. And she was raised by brothers who were reputed to be quite cruel to her. When she turned 18, she ran away. She couldn't afford San Francisco, ended up in Sacramento, and it wasn't like it is today, where if you're a young woman on your own, you could go work at a Starbucks or a Costco or sign up at City College. No one would hire her. I know there was that one profession, but as far as I know, she wasn't part of it. But she did end up in Chinatown begging my great-grandfather for a job, and he did hire her to sell what we called in our family fancy underwear for fancy ladies. Um, they fell in love, decided to get married, but of course here in California it was against the law for Chinese down to a quarter to marry in this state until 1948. It was against, the, um, my great grandparents went to a lawyer who signed a contract between two people as though they were forming a partnership. My grandparents went to Mexico to get married, and my own parents were only the second couple in our whole extended family to legal, be legally married here in the US. Anyway, when I was a little girl, and this is all in On Gold Mountain, in, which is my first book, I really tried to tell the history of the Chinese in America through the eyes of my family. Um, but when I was a little girl, I, I lived with my mother. Um, but her family was tiny. I, I think back then about 10 people, there were only three left. Uh, and my sister and I are two of them, I'm, you know, two of that three, so it's, it was really tiny all along. But on my father's side, this is back when people had really big families, just not on my mother's side, I had about 400 relatives in Los Angeles. Uh, about a dozen that looked like me, the majority full Chinese, and then this spectrum in between. And so when I was a kid and I looked around me, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food, and of course that's, that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. We have time for one more question. Lisa, I was a big fan of your mother, uh, Carolyn, 
and she was a big influence on my life. And uh, I just wonder how much influence she had as an author on your becoming an author. Yeah, my mother, Carolyn C., was a writer, and uh, she was a huge influence on my life, obviously. My mother's father was also a writer. So this is, you know, my maternal side. Um, he, he was an old Texas newspaper man. I'm going to just go over to him for a second. He was an old Texas newspaper man. When, you know, like many people wanted to write the great American novel, but never, he was, he was quite the womanizer. He had five wives. And um, when he was 69, his fifth wife, who was considerably younger, had a baby. And uh, we went to visit. And my mom at that time, she was a single mother, and one of, and you know, but a PhD in English, not a lot of jobs, obviously, but she was um, an expert witness in pornography trials. And so um, this is how she supported us. It was good work. <laughs> and and um, we went down to see this baby, this new baby. And I have to tell you, my grandfather was very depressed. Kind of like that, you know, just really. And, there, and I just remember this so clearly being at the kitchen table. My mom had this stack of books she had to read before trial the next week. And she and my dad, uh, grandfather, was just like depressed. And my mom said, oh, daddy, why don't you read one of these? It might cheer you up. <laughs> and so he went down the hall. He came back a couple of hours later. And he really was very cheerful. <laughs> But not for the reason you think. He said, you know, I could write something better than this. And so from the time he was 69 until he died, he wrote 74 hardcore pornographic novels. <laughs> they say, write what you know. Anyway, when, actually, when I was doing research for On Gold Mountain, my mother's papers are at UCLA in special collections, and I was looking through her papers and, you know, finding this stuff, you know, between, uh, you know, what my father had written to her, what she'd written to him, and that was a disastrous marriage that, you know, lasted all of 30 seconds. And, um, but I did find this letter from my grandfather to my mother when she was in college, and she said, and he said, you know, if you want to become a writer, you need to write a thousand words a day. And my mom followed that. She was a teacher, among other things, a professor of, of writing, and, and she told that to all of her students. She definitely instilled it in me. And so, uh, in so many, and, and, and you too, and so in so many ways, although, you know, our writing style completely different, um, the things we wrote about completely different, but the work ethic and that thousand words, you know, is now very well situated in this third generation of writers. Well, I think we should just thank Lisa C. for coming. Thank you.